When I first saw the Chthonic Fisher skill tree from the Warlock reveal, I knew I had to play Torment, because overall it sounded like exactly the sort of build I'd enjoy. Fast, easy to scale, quite powerful for single target, and you're able to build in good amounts of defenses and quality of life from things like Profane Veil. And it turns out all of those things are true. Now, I originally started this character as a Bleed Warlock, and I was Merchant's Guild. That didn't go very well for me. Turns out Bleed Warlock is very intensive, and Merchant's Guild leaves you in an awkward middle ground where you can't quite gear up. So when I swapped to Torment, I went Circle of Fortune, and I had a great time, because the progression was extremely smooth and easy. In fact, I'd say that if you're planning to play Warlock, you should probably level as Bleed and transition into Torment for most of your endgame gearing process, because it's going to be easier than anything else, and after you're already geared up and comfortable, you can swap to whatever else you'd rather play. So today, I'm going to go over some of my choices, some of the ways in which my build differs from Volka's Guide, which I did use as inspiration, and quite a bit more. Before I do, though, did you know that I have a second channel? That's where I put all the content that isn't directly related to ARPGs, like the best games that I played in February 2024. That's going to be coming out very soon, alongside two game spotlights for Millennia and Tales of Kinzara Zhao. So if you like learning about more games, or maybe you're just looking for something else to play when you're done blasting Last Epoch, do head over to the channel, get subscribed, and hey, maybe you'll find your new favorite game over there. But for now, let's get back to talking about Torment Lock. So first up, how do you play Torment Warlock? Well, you see, it's a very complicated rotation. While clearing, you have to press Chthonic Fisher, and occasionally Wandering Spirits will be off cooldown, so you should press that as well. Most of the time, that's all you need to do, especially in lower corruptions. As you get into higher corruptions, you may also need to use Transplant so that you don't get body blocked. You should probably use that on cooldown just to move faster anyway. And you might want to use Spirit Plague. Spirit Plague is not only damage over time effect, but it stacks single target damage, which you can then unleash with Chthonic Fissure. Oh, and if you ever get into trouble or want to tank some damage, just right click, or at least for me, it's right click, Proven Veil, no problems at all because you'll dodge almost everything except for certain boss abilities that are undodgeable. Yeah, fun stuff like that. In comparison to a lot of the heavier combo-based builds in Last Epoch, I found Torment Warlock to be extremely relaxing to play. Even at lower gear, when I was going through easier content or speed farming, which really was everything up until like three to 400 corruption, I could just throw out a Fissure, keep up my Wandering Spirits, and not worry about any of the other buttons until I got to single target or a boss. On the other hand, when I did start getting to those bosses, I found that cast speed was a lot more valuable than I initially thought. So I ended up weaving a little bit of it into my build, which felt really good. I don't really have too much early game experience here since I kind of re-rolled into the character after playing something else. But even when I had first just re-geared, I found the gameplay to be incredibly smooth. I never really hit that point where I was like, okay, my damage is falling off. If anything, the opposite. My damage has always been great, and what I've been working on and focusing on with my gearing is actually my defenses. Unfortunately, the game doesn't really want me to do that. As you'll see in the gearing section, a lot of my slams have ended up giving me damage rather than the defenses that I was actually aiming for. And so now let's get into that in a little bit more detail. All right, so first up the skills. Now the most important skill is Chthonic Fissure, since that's the source of your torment, thus your main damage. There isn't really too much room to spec this differently. You need to come over to Spirit Gale, all the way down to Twisted Waves, since it's a massive amount of damage. You want to stack Necrotic Res for your ward-based defenses anyway, so this is just free damage. And then you get Grim Tide to turn Crit Multi into an additional damage multiplier. So far, I've been very, very unlucky with that. For some reason, the gods of Itera have decided that I am not allowed to slam Crit Multi on any legendary items, so this node has been underperforming for me but hopefully it'll be a little bit more impactful for you. If you're scaling Torment, you'll also want to come up over here since it's a very big multi. You'll probably want to come over here. Enemies are always going to be cursed, so it's another 48% multi. And that leaves you with only a few points to play with to do fun stuff. For a while, I was actually using Chaotic Rupture to get Chaos Bolts to proc to get additional Bone Curse hits. And then I decided that it wasn't really worth the mana costs. So I went back I just went into Severed Words. Uh, as a note, technically this is an optional thing. You could drop these if you have another source of Necrotic Res Shred. But hey, stacking up very quickly off of your spirits seems pretty chill. And then I added Spirit Gale just because I like watching things proliferate through packs. Admittedly, Death From Below could honestly be better. 
Next up, another damaging ability, Wandering Spirits. I don't actually have plus two Wandering Spirits on my chess piece. Uh, I should. I had a chess piece with it, and that chess piece got into a little bit of an accident because I was trying to be too greedy and seal stuff. So I had to drop a couple of damage points here, a damage point here, and a damage point here. The main goal with this is to get low cooldowns and then stack all of the damage bonuses. Spectral Putrescence is not because you are a poison build. Instead, the point here is to just get extra damage from poisoned mines. And I mean, hey, you're taking Souls of Rage anyway, and a little extra damage can't hurt. Instead of fearing stuff, you're going to be doing a lot of damage with False Courage, and all these nodes down here are damage. The one I want to touch on, though, is Familiar Souls. Lowering the reveal range might seem bad, and if you're using Wandering Spirits as a clear skill, it's absolutely terrible. But this is much more of a single target augment. Your Fisher is hyper aggressive at shooting spirits everywhere. In fact, let me show you. If I put down a Fisher, those spirits go everywhere. You don't need to worry about extra skills for clear, and even if you did, that's what Spirit Flake's for. So this is much more about single target, thus it's single target focused. I did think about Song of the Lost Chantry. I've used it in the past on my previous Necrodot build, which was a Lich. Uh, I've heard it's still bugged, and so I'm just not going to touch it. Then we have Spirit Plague. Specializing this is absolutely crucial. You'll want to come here for Plague of Eyes. Gives it a good bit of extra damage because you're intelligence stacking. Perpetuity, which is really powerful because it gives you 60% cast speed. And then most importantly, Exsanguination. This means you get five bleeds on yourself, which you might say, wait a minute, why are we bleeding ourselves five times when casting this? What's the benefit to the build? The benefit to the build is that is how you stack a whole bunch of damage, which I'll explain in the gearing section when I get into Immolator's Ablation. So very important and having high cast speed on this is very important to the point where having a gear swap for even more cast speed can be advisable on single target. And I have my main defenses, Profane Veil. This adds another curse, Penance. Also, a little extra utility with Forked Tongue where I can kind of project it out, which you can see right here. That one stays behind. It can run towards the boss while I dodge an AoE. Desecrated Graves lets me put Bone Curse on stuff. Uh, being able to put Bone Curse on targets is very, very effective. Over here, Seance is great. It helps to buff your Wandering Spirits damage. Wandering Spirits is a buff on you. I'm assuming the scales dynamically. Oh yeah, and you gain Ward per Uncapped Necrotic Res. You know, the thing that you have a ton of. Over here, Stream of Profanity is not just the most demonetizable thing on YouTube. It is, in fact, a way to reset the cooldown of your I Win button. Because during Profane Veil, you dodge everything. You are invulnerable. Again, except from certain boss abilities that cannot be dodged, therefore they pierce the veil, and that's a very bad time. So do watch out for that. Unfortunately, I don't have a list for you, but luckily Tunk Lab does if you want to sort through all the things that all the bosses do. I prefer a much simpler method of, does it kill me or does it not kill me? Because if it kills me, then it goes through Profane Veil. And if it doesn't kill me, I'm totally fine to stand in it more. And then we have something that's my own little twist. Volca had Transplant specialized, and defensively, Transplant is probably a lot better. But the reason that I like Bone Curse is because the Cull felt a lot more reliable. I think technically the min-max thing to do would be specialize Transplant while mapping, and then swap to Bone Curse while bossing, but I'm way too lazy to re-specialize that much, so I just went with Bone Curse. Now, there's just another upside here, which is I get Marked for Death, that lowers enemy resistances, increasing damage, allowing me to burst down bosses better. The downside is that my bone armor is a lot less consistent from Marrow Thief than it would be from teleporting around with Transplant. So you can kind of think of this as a little bit less defensive, but a bit more damage. Oh, and I'm converting it over with Misery so that I could scale bonuses to necrotic damage, thus scaling the damage when all of my spirits and random stuff happen to hit a boss that has Bone Curse on it. There's no damage meters in Last Epoch, so I can't tell you, oh, this is a 8% DPS gain, it's absolutely worth it. For all I know, these points are completely useless, but I didn't really have anything else to put my points into because I'm not using the bugged minion notes. The main reason for that is I think plenty of people know about that already, and I want this video to be relevant in six months when the bug is long fixed. So that's what I've done and a little bit of a logic behind it. 
at least for skills. What about passives? But before you can master being a warlock, first you must become an acolyte and study hard. So we began with some forbidden knowledge. This is a great way to get both intelligence and necrotic res, a hyper-efficient node. Then bone aura is really just for points because you have to get to 20 somehow. Uh, Mania of mortality, sometimes it's kind of funny to get a bunch of ward. Realistically, it's not about that. It's about coming over to a natural preservation where you get ward retention, necrotic res, and poison res. Retention means you have higher stable ward and you lose ward slower after you gain a bunch from killing and hitting enemies. Uh, in Lich, it's just Apocrypha. This is a good old chunk of Int and a little bit of mana regen to make things slightly smoother. But Warlock's where the party's really at. Starting off Soul Stealer. Again, a bunch of mana regen. Then, Unholy Torment. Spell damage for curses. Guess what? Most of your damage comes from curses because several of your skills are in fact curse skills. A Spirit Plague is a good example of this. But Occultist's Mind for Intelligence and additional mana per int. That way you have a bigger pool and you can recover. Gotta be chill with your cast, not worry too much. Spirit Leech for, well, Leech. 3%'s not too bad. Over here, a Word of Malevolence. A great way to get a bunch of extra word scaling, especially if you go into Imperishable. Remember this build has a ton of Necrotic Res, so that's something like 500 word decay threshold. Then Doom Herald, because when you're channeling Profane Veil, damage over time effects do still tick on you. So you definitely want the extra defenses and you deal more damage to damned enemies while channeling. Enemies should always be damned. So this is just nice for anything that will snapshot and scale dynamically. Harrowing Armor, Armor Bonus, especially on bosses. Dark Protections, 25 ward per second isn't too shabby. Less damage taken. Well, if you're stacking a few curses, that's going to add up. I would assume that adds together rather than multiplying, but I'll be honest, I didn't really test that because the numbers are so small that it didn't feel too relevant. Then, Int and Vit. Int for damage and defense. Vit for a little bit of extra life. That's especially nice to not get chain stunned too often. Uh, Wither. Wither is very, very important because it increases damage taken from curses by 10%. They can stack 20 times. So you definitely want all the wither stacks on your enemies. This is a massive, massive damage multiplier. And then encroaching darkness, you get, that's right, a free curse, which you can then trigger. Oh, and 18 spell damage for curses. The spell damage for curse thing is really interesting because a lot of curses are damage over time effects. So that is not 18 damage for every tick. That is 18 damage over the curse's duration scaled by its damage effectiveness, which on Torment is 600% if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it's a pretty nice chunk of damage. Fleeting Crone for haste on kill. Realistically, this is just gotta go fast. And then wreak havoc, which remember, there was a node that gave extra damage for crit multi. That's all it is. The chaotic strike stuff, you can just completely ignore that part. And that's why there's not very much put into chaotic strikes because it's really just there to enable 40% more damage from wreak havoc. And so that's all about the passives. Honestly, this is a part that I don't think needs any change or adjustment. There's a lot of room in some builds to customize the passives for what you want grab a little bit of extra damage or a little bit of extra defenses. Warlock feels kind of cookie cutter if you're going curses, because you kind of just take everything that says curse and everything that scales your curses, and you worry about defenses everywhere else, because most of the defensive nodes are baked into the curse stuff anyway. All right, now it's time for the fun part. Gear, blessings, and idols. I'll start off with blessings. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about the loot ones. So, Grand Emptiness of Ash, this is a great way to get a massive damage multiplier. Keep in mind, 36% more isn't actually 36% more because it's adding to all your other crit multi, but since I have relatively little, it's actually contributing pretty close to the full value. The more crit multi you have, the less important this is, and the more you have some options to swap it out for Void Res. Then we also have Grand Resonance of a Sea, which is 41 ward per second. This helps keep higher stable permanent ward, which you can see right next to my head here. As a note, uh, this requires you to fight Lagan. I don't really recommend doing this over and over until you get a perfect one. I happen to get pretty lucky after a couple tries. Now from Reign of Dragons, I'm currently using Resolve of Humanity, but the Necrotic Res Blessing, which uh, should show up here, 
yeah, uh, Dream of Etera is definitely better. It's just that I kept getting poorly rolled Dream of Etera. And personally, I would value 20% all res over like 50 to 55% necrotic res. Kind of depends on the rest of your gear. I happen to have a kind of crappy all res ring that I could have swapped in, but I ended up with more necrotic res this way until I either A, got a better ring or B, got a better blessing. And then for the last two, it's just armor and armor because this build doesn't have any other armor. Even now, I'm only at about 43% mitigation, though to be honest, 43% isn't terrible because bone armor procs will come into effect and that'll put me over 50, which felt pretty comfy. Coming back to my inventory, I didn't really focus too much on idols. Got this one quite early on, which is very, very good health and ward retention. I also got this, a little bit of necrotic res and damage over time. And this, which happened to be just enough void res, so I kept it. Realistically, this should probably have been replaced a while ago. Then on my other idols, I was looking for increased duration for Profane Veil or chance to gain ward. Necrotic res is a suffix, armor granted by bone armor, uh, damage for curses. This the prefix is garbage. It just happens to be something that I was wearing to get extra necrotic res. Uh, if I wanted to go for more damage, I do have some alternatives in my stash here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, something like this. Way more damage, but slightly less defensive. Actually, I guess this one, because sometimes I do get to low health. So yeah, you have several options. You can either go for maximum damage or you can go for maximum defenses. Also, an extra Profane Veil duration would feel quite nice, but I felt that Necrotic Res was better overall and the chance to gain Word on hit wasn't terrible. In terms of my character, if I was going to continue playing the build and improving it, this is probably where I'd focus because at rank nine in Circle of Fortune, you get a lot of idols very cheaply. They are the cheapest prophecies to roll I just haven't really bothered. Coming over to my items, though, I have a Bone Clamor Bar Boot. This item is amazing. I happen to get one with 2 LP and slam spell damage for curses and necro res. Uh, I then left it because it's pretty much perfect. On the other hand, my Immolator Sublation, while it is a lot of damage, that uh, 6 spell damage for fire and necrotic sales per stack of ignite, yeah, it's up to 40 stacks of ignite, not up to 40 damage. So, the more cast speed you have, the easier it is to stack. For single target, I don't actually use my Ghost Maker. Instead, because of the Immolators, I use a Mad Alchemist Ladle for the 1% cast speed per intelligence. It was uh, unfortunately very allergic to crit multi. As you can see, I very, very quickly ramped up to over 40 stacks, which is the maximum. And in comparison, while I do get there eventually, it's much slower, and it takes noticeably more casts. For clear, though, I highly, highly, highly recommend Ghostmaker. You won't need the extra damage, and the 61 ward on kill when you're killing things constantly is absolutely incredible. It is a fairly rare item, so anything beyond 1 LP could take you a bit of time. I happen to get this one with a pretty well-rolled necrotic damage on it, so I'm quite happy. And it gives you a bunch of wraiths, so you feel like you have your own personal army. In terms of stats, things like necrotic damage, damage over time, necrotic pen, minion necrotic pen. Uh, ideally, you want crit multi on a weapon. I tried for both of these. I missed on both. It is what it is. In order to get the bleed chance converted over to ignite chance, though, for the emulators to work, you also need Malin's Hubris. Malin's Hubris is a pretty okay pair of gloves. They're mediocre at best. They give some fit, some in, but not super high rolls. However, they're quite easy to get one LP for. So I ended up with 53% necrotic res on mine, and I haven't hit two LP at least so far. What I did get very lucky with is Omnis. Not only is it one LP, but I slammed on necrotic damage, which uh, sadly has not been necrotic res that I was hoping to slam or the crit multi I was hoping to slam. But hey, at least it didn't hit the one junk mod, which was really all I wanted because Omnis is quite rare and powerful. It does so much in this build because you really, really, really want your suffixes to be as much necrotic res as possible. This provides a whole bunch of other resistances, allowing you to fix res without resistant suffixes. Now, this is one of the cases where base type is actually more important than modifiers, in my opinion. 
Opulent Focus gives you word per second, word retention, and intelligence, which is really, really strong. So I wouldn't use anything but an Opulent Focus. I happen to get Cast Speed, which with Ghostmaker's nice quality of life, Crit Multi, Void Res, and Ellie Res, which happens to be everything I need right now. I guess I'm a little bit overcapped on fire, but overall it's pretty damn perfect. So I just haven't been able to replace this because it does everything just a little bit too well. Then I have my Twisted Heart of Ukaros. This relic gives you health, it gives you strength, which is armor, it gives you cast speed, plus one to level of skills or plus two to Chthonic Fisher because, hey, shout out to all the necrotic and elemental skills in the audience. Plus, I even slam necrotic res on. And when you use a spell, you know, a necrotic spell, your health gets eaten. Yes, that's why my health keeps going down there and converted over into word. And the word is based off of current health. So when you get down to zero, it stops eating it. Overall, I really like this item, but I don't think it's completely irreplaceable. I could very much see a lot of other things, especially with three and four LP, like a grimoire of necrotic elixirs, as suggested by Volca in his guide. I happened to get one with one LP though, and I was pretty happy with that. I haven't gotten a three or four LP grimoire to try to replace it with. For boots, I think you're supposed to really go either move speed or CDR for the exalted affix, but I ended up really liking the sealed traversal skill extra word per missing mana stuff and word gain when you use a traversal skill. So these are the boots that I went with. The reduced bonus damage taken from crits is very important for mitigating enemy crit strikes. You can get that either as a suffix on a couple of pieces or here on your boots and also as a suffix on say your chest piece. This is my very temporary chess piece um, that has a lot of health. I actually quite like having health instead of armor. Even if armor might ultimately be more mitigation, the high tier health roll at least, T6, felt really good versus a T5 armor roll and something like T7 int. Unfortunately, the spirit frequency isn't that great. It triggers bone curse more, but realistically, this should be something else. It's just the, the previous one that I had with wandering spirits I tried to use a rune of removal and I got very unlucky. So that happened and I haven't replaced it since because I was farming for rings. Uh, this ring annoyingly works out quite well. So I haven't replaced it yet. I really like the big old chunk of health, which is mostly why I haven't replaced it. It's T7 almost max rolled. I think if it didn't have T7, I'd probably have replaced it already because T5 health, not really the best for this build. Now, coming over here for a second, yeah, I have about 2,000 health. The reason for this is I found stuns annoying when I had less life. Uh, you do get a little bit more value out of other stats in terms of damage and ward scaling, but ultimately this felt a lot better to me because I wasn't getting perma stunned. And then same thing here, my rings could honestly need work. I've been dropping quite a few, but as it turns out, getting an ivory ring with T7 necrotic res isn't the easiest thing, and I've had a 100% success chance at breaking my rings so far. That said, I'm complaining about that like it's a problem. It has not been a problem. Actually, this build has just been straight blasting, and I feel like I could farm whatever I want at this point. But I also feel like at this point, my gear isn't going to meaningfully change. The numbers are gonna get better. Like this, the necrotic res could go up to T5. The other suffix could become something else. That's not gonna play any differently. So in a lot of ways, my build does feel finished, at least for where I am right now. I got to a very random mix of about three to 500 corruption, or if you're in Fall of the Outcasts, of course, 100. Because uh, who wants corruption in Fall of the Outcasts? But no, in some places I actually farmed like Reign of Dragons. You'll see right over here, Empowered Monos, 413. It's about the mid-range of where I got. I think it's a little lower in Age of Winter. Yep, 331. And so overall, the farming has been quite smooth. Now, when I first thought about playing Torment Warlock, I actually envisioned a rather different build, mostly because I forgot that Barboot existed, and so I wasn't really thinking about the Ward aspect. But after checking out Volka's guide over on Maxroll, I realized Ward was definitely the thing to do here, especially because I had never really played Ward builds in the past, and I found that Ward builds are kind of broken, and no, I'm not talking just about the bugs, I'm talking about Ward in general. It's a highly effective tool at extending your effective health pool, which means that you can take damage, be more careless and get hit by a lot extra. I also found that as enemy health scaled up and as enemy damage scaled up, 
I kind of felt myself playing a little bit less of a damage over time setup and a little bit more of a burst mage setup. Where, yes, I'd want to keep my Chthonic Fissure down and I'd want to keep my Wandering Spirits active. But I wouldn't worry too much about snapshotting the damage from the Ignite stacks at all times. Instead, I'd only do that when I actually had the opportunity. And that means the boss wasn't doing something that was about to murder my face. So instead what I'd do is keep the basic Fissure down that would kill most normal enemies and even some of the tankier rares. Then, when I got the chance to stand still and load up, such as before an exiled mage, I'd get pretty close to 40 ignite stacks, snapshot my fissure, since yes, it does snapshot, and absolutely blow everything up while sitting in my profane veil and laughing at the enemy's pathetic attempts to damage me. Don't they know that I'm ethereal? Oh wait, right, some boss abilities go through that. I probably shouldn't be saying this so smugly. Now, I did also play a stock standard version exactly as Volca had it set up in his guide, at least for a little bit both because I wanted to see how the guide felt to play, and also because even though I had a couple of different directions I wanted to go in, such as originally focusing much, much more on the Anguish Curse and Procting with Chaos Bolt, which uh, led to mana issues, lag, and uh, bad time in general, well, I also just wanted to see if his version was better for speed farming, because I suspected that it was. And yes, if you're speed farming, absolutely spec transplant. You won't need the cull from Bone Curse anyway. You will have plenty of damage, and being able to zip around feels really, really fun. The other fairly big difference is while Volca just uses a Ghostmaker, I tended to swap between Ladle and Ghostmaker. I did this because I was fighting Fire Lich Cremoris a lot for Immolator's Ablation. And I realized that if I was just using Ghostmaker, I couldn't quite burst him down. But if I swapped over to Ladle and pre-stacked my Ignites, I could absolutely burst him down before he even got to his first Necrotic phase. This is a uh, tier four, by the way, and it went really, really well. So after learning that, for boss fights where I wasn't gonna be killing a ton of adds and didn't need the ward on kill from Ghostmaker, I went with Ladle for the higher burst potential. Now, to be clear, Ghostmaker is more damage if you aren't gonna be stacking Ignites on yourself. But the cast speed per int from Ladle allows you to stack Ignites much more efficiently and maintain higher stacks when you're trying to burst stuff. So the more aggressive and dangerous the enemies, the more Ladle felt better. But the downside of Ladle is that you don't get Ward and Kill, which can absolutely get you murdered. In terms of the gearing for this build, there's kind of a beautiful simplicity to it. Just get as much necrotic resistance as you can, and well, all of your other problems will go away. Since necrotic resistance is damage, it scales the damage of your torment. Necrotic resistance is extra Ward, and necrotic resistance is other defensive effects as well. Not only does it give ward per second, but it gives ward decay threshold, preventing the ward from decaying down. I also think this is a really good build if you're not experienced with the ward playstyle. Going straight into the bleed lock was kind of hard just because it's not an easy setup to get going if you don't understand the low life mechanics. This one though, treats ward as an extra thing on top of your health rather than a complete replacement for it. So even if you're unfamiliar with the mechanics, it actually went really well for me. And so in terms of beginner-friendly builds, I can absolutely recommend Torment Warlock. I think it's super beginner-friendly. The Omnis is great and all, but you absolutely don't need it. And in fact, all the other items, base versions will probably be totally fine. I'm also sure if I wanted to push the build, I could go to a thousand corruption or beyond, but I don't really want to. At this point, I'm kind of bored of farming for the build because for me, the thing that's interesting is tinkering with different stuff and putting the puzzle together. I feel like this one is, kind of truly solid, at least for now. And so I'm probably going to move on to something else, at least if I can muster the will to do so. But hey, I did get a really cool Herald of a Scurry recently. So if you want to see me play Squirrels, let me know down below. But that's been my experiences playing Necrodot or Torment Warlock. Overall, a great build and one that I can absolutely recommend to beginners. Now I'm not gonna include a planner for my gear since my gear is honestly scuffed and Volk has done an amazing job of setting up several planners at different levels to help you in your gearing needs. So instead, I'll just link to his guide down in the description below. With that said, if you're looking for more Last Epoch content to watch after this, maybe check out my video on Immolator's Ablation, where I explain its mechanics in more detail. Or alternatively, if you've already seen that or you're looking for some non-Last Epoch content, then head over to my second channel and check out one of my recent videos where I was trying a variety of indie games. Both of those will be up in the card and down below, along with some other supplementary resources. With that said, thank you very much to all the patrons and channel members for the continued support. 
For as low as $1 a month, you can help make videos just like this one possible. And you might even see your name on screen like these fine folks here. Also, a big thanks to everyone who watched to the end. I hope you learned something, I'm glad you enjoyed the video, and hopefully this style's a little bit more efficient. I've tried to bake the key mechanics more into the actual content of the video itself, because otherwise I find people tend to skip them and then wonder why their build doesn't work. Spoiler alert, it's because you skipped the thing labeled key mechanics. But hey, I know that everyone who makes it to the end here doesn't skip key mechanics, so congrats, you're the real gay chads. That's all for me today. Thanks again. I'll see you soon.